Welcome to the Sustainable Hospitality Podcast, where green practices meet profitable solutions. Join us as we uncover the latest trends in eco-friendly hospitality that not only safeguard our planet, but also drive down operating costs and boost revenue. Every week, we will bring you compelling conversations with industry leaders who are at the forefront of merging sustainability with economic success. Whether you're a hotelier, a resort manager, or a passionate traveler, this is your gateway to the future of sustainable hospitality. Tune in and let's explore how going green is good for both the earth and your bottom line. We're your hosts, Amy Wald, and Kathy McGuire. Well, welcome back to another episode of the Sustainable Hospitality Podcast. I'm one of your hosts, Amy Wald. And today, drum roll, everyone, we have the legend, Glenn Hausman. And did I say the name right? (laughs) Yeah, but I think we got, we need more of a rim shot than a drum roll. Wow, yeah, we do. (laughs) See, I bring him on for all of the uh, ooey gooey's. (laughs) All right. Well, I obviously didn't prepare because I didn't put uh, your last name into Google Translate. Uh, Hey, so uh, it looks like you and I now have something in common. So that's a good way to kick things off. I think uh, preparation is the uh, the enemy of spontaneity (laughs) when it comes to uh, podcasting. Absolutely. Who can be themselves when they have to prepare so much? Anyway. Uh, I find, honestly, I find that people sometimes over prepare for stuff and they don't trust that they're already experts in their respective thing and they should just go with their gut. I, you know what? I agree Mm -hmm. as a professional winger. (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) Just kidding. I'm I'm trying to tamp that down. She is a fan of the, a fan of the eighties band (laughs) winger is what we're talking about here. I love this. It's usually very, it's much more serious than this. So I am so excited. to talk. I I take winger very seriously. (laughs) (laughs) Winger. Oh my gosh. My hair looked like winger back. (laughs) Well, (laughs) <laughs> For the sake of the audience yeah. not having to listen yeah. to, um, I, w- I won't say your bad jokes, my bad jokes, but I want to give a little, for those people out there, I can't imagine anyone is not aware of you, but you are one of most well-known advocate, commentator, educator, and hospitality strategic advisor in both 2022 and 2023, recognized by the International Hospitality Institute as the number one social media influencer in hospitality. And your show, No Vacancy Live, was named the number one podcast in hospitality. Gives me something to strive for. Uh, 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 Don't work too hard. I don't think I can handle being knocked out to number two. Our ego's too too delicate. (laughs) In July 2023, No Vacancy Team won Industry Award from ICH. R-I-E. I agree. They're the uh, I agree. they're the educational they're the educational folks. All of the uh, the colleges that teach hospitality and stuff like that, which is pretty cool. So cool, and it shows dedication to education. While May 2022, 2022 you received the Leadership Excellent uh, Excellence Award from SCAL USA for your tireless work bringing the hotel industry together during the COVID crisis. Uh, I, I still have the bags under my eyes. They look closely. <laughs> <laughs> Glenn, you publish NoVacancyNews.com, which is yes, an I industry do. news site, mm-hmm. professional keynote speaker, event host, moderator, consultant, and strategic speaker and media trainer. Um, I mean, we could go on and on and on, but you have been quoted uh, in leading. Whoa. Uh, yeah, don't uh, please. So, um, well, get I just New York Times, yeah, yeah, but you're reading off the bio that I had to put together to make myself look good. And That's now that you're actually true. reading it, I feel very shameful. Well, we're going to put in the show notes <laughs> how everyone can find you if, if by some surprise they are not following you right now. You could usually find me at the entrance to a buffet at your favorite Las Vegas casino. <laughs> Is that your favorite place to go? No, I actually used to love buffets growing up, but uh, now not so much. I find You've that you get better. I, because I, as I start to get older, I don't eat as much uh, quantity anymore. Right. So I could get um, more of what I'd like at a higher quality at a better uh, at a better value away from the buffets. Otherwise, it's just like, and I'm just sick for three days and nobody needs a sick one in a casino. It's not pretty. 
No, nobody needs to sick anybody in a casino. <laughs> but Glenn, talk to yes. us. Tell us. Tell us your back. Tell us how you came to be where you are today. Um, you obviously love hospitality. I yeah. do as well. And talk to us about that journey and um, how you really created such a cool platform for you to do what you love, for you to talk to people about what they love to do. Mm -hmm. Take it away. All right. So uh, basically, um, I was in print journalism in the hospitality side for a long, long time, and I really started to get bored with it. Unfortunately, I feel like I was born a naturally curious person. I like to ask questions. I like to have interesting conversations and stuff. But I started to get bored by the mathematical formula in writing articles because I really believe everything has a formula to it. And I started to become bored. So my old job, I just started uh, podcasting because I enjoyed it. This is before anybody really knew what it was, this is like 12, 13 years ago or so, I think, at this point. So I did uh, 100 episodes of a show there, and I kind of learned how to podcast. And as I was doing that particular journey, I realized that this is really what I love to do. Also, I'm super lazy and don't like writing uh, anymore. So it really became a, a, a matter of, a, a way to move my career in a direction that intrigued me while also removing some of the things that I didn't really like. And at a certain point, I saw the market was starting to shift towards people wanting to consume podcasts and videos at simultaneously to the rise of uh, content marketing. So I knew there was an opportunity for me to go onto that side of the media business and be able to feed my family and pay my mortgage if I just... Uh, took the the leap uh, ahead to go and do it. Wow, well, that lots of foresight in there, okay? Yeah, but it was also the hardest thing I ever did, and I don't want to minimize that, make it seem like it was easy. It really took a, a year of uh, planning um, and thoughtfulness before actually quitting my job because I was paid nicely, and I was able to pay all of my bills, and I had young youngish children, and, uh, you know, it was a big risk, but... I have to thank my support system around me for buying into the idea and allowing me to make uh, what could have been a crazy decision, but a lot of with a lot of hope and a lot of hustle, you know, you make things work. And I, I was by no means diminishing that, and I'm glad you made that. No, point. I, I didn't think I didn't grab that. I didn't think that at all. No, no, no. I, just, I know, but I just want to be clear to the audience because I think sure. a lot of times people think these things are easy and yes. they they come out of nowhere, but yes. there's so much stress involved in that. And for the year leading up to me quitting, I was not a happy person. I was very unhappy at this, the stage of life I was in. I was really freaking miserable, but I visualized myself in a better place a year from then and realized that that state is temporary. And I managed to somehow get the guts to, uh, to do it. So really the hardest thing I ever had to do. Well, congratulations. Yeah. It was obviously a good move. Yeah. Uh, and your passion translates in everything that you do, which is one of the many reasons I reached out to you and wanted to have you on the show. Well, aren't we freaking lucky, though? How awesome it is that we get to work in the hospitality business, right? And I get to meet the most wonderful, interesting, smart, fascinating, creative people wherever I go. And I get to travel and uh, have a, a, a lifestyle that's a uh, commensurate with someone who makes way, way much more money <laughs> than, than I do and have such amazing experiences. I mean, there's nothing to love about it. Plus, the other thing is about the hospitality industry. To me, it's like the one interesting thing about every other business all combined into one. You can talk real estate, technology, design, consumer behavior. I can go on and on and on, food and beverage. You know what I mean? And it's just awesome. And you know, you hit on it. I mean, obviously we both love hospitality. I can remember when I was a little girl, we would drive to Florida to go to Disney mm -hmm. World. I couldn't wait to get in the Holiday Inn. Everything about it, the smell, everything. Right. But Amy, I still feel that way. I do too. Because the, I do too. Uh, me, the, every single time I put the key into the door, I am so effing excited to see what's on the other side of that door. Although I know, because I'm probably staying at a hotel <laughs> brand I've stayed at before. But that the point is, it's always like, because it's not just the room. It's like that feeling you're going to have of adventure and excitement and then doing new things and having new experiences while you're staying in that room. Absolutely. And for, you know, I wanted to touch on this and we are now, but 
for someone thinking about a career, mm -hmm. you literally can pinpoint something that interests you totally. within the world of hospitality and create a career out of it. And I think we are in such a pivotal moment um, to help two things, mm -hmm. get the industry back on its feet and, mm -hmm. and help people find jobs and really create behavior change. And I can't wait to talk to you about that as well, because this is called the Sustainable Hospitality Podcast. That is true. And so. I love sustainability and I love people <laughs> that can have sustainable careers. <laughs> well, what what was your initial goal with No Vacancy? Um, has it evolved and changed? Yeah. Yeah. Um, so my initial goal was uh, get the heck out of an old job and control my own destiny doing something that I love. Nothing against the old job that place helped create who I have been able to become. But at a certain point, you need to have your own set of challenges and you know create new uh, hurdles for yourself. Plus I get bored very easily and I need to keep changing things up. Um, so that was just a great experience. And over time, it went from a weekly one hour podcast that was broken down into two segments. The first segment was me and a rotating group of uh, guests, right? Like I'd have, uh, somebody from one company one week, another company, and kind of rotate with five or six uh, regulars over there. And the second half was with a notable personality kind of thing like I do today within the hospitality business. But um, just before COVID started, I got access to LinkedIn Live and I'd been wanting to switch over to doing video anyway, because we were just at that point where people were starting to be interested in watching videos as well. And I'm like, oh, I could have an audio and video feed. Video feed will be pretty good. Plus <clears throat> you have better, conversations i think with people if you're looking right at them like we are right now even if it winds up just being uh audio so um the one thing that i did was started going on to uh linkedin and then um when covid unfortunately uh began uh i lost everything like most of us did I'm not trying to say i'm special or anything like that but my instinct was to just get on and share information and we started going on every single day five days a week uh for for covid and then we kind of moved to four hard news days a week and one day of drinking and uh <laughs> then we we kind of uh kind of moved on from there but also the latest change is i'm still doing that live show three days a week because i get to have more in-depth conversations but as the way that people want to digest information changes i'm putting a lot more emphasis on doing shorter form videos as well that really get to the point and you could have a real good insight in a three to five minute segment instead of uh 45 minutes to an hour oh that's really smart because my podcasts go way too long i talk and talk and talk <laughs> Well, that's uh, really interesting. In that. I, honestly, 43 minutes of my weekly podcast is just uh, myself <laughs> okay. or my co-host Anthony talking and the guests going, uh, but, uh, and, you know. <laughs> I know. I, I have to admit, I play some back and I'm like cringing. Mm -hmm. I'm like, God, be quiet, Amy. Amy, uh, I cringe at every piece of content I've ever done. I disgust myself looking okay. back on stuff. That makes me feel, I don't want you to disgust yourself, but I... Oh gosh, sometimes I just I'm horrified. I'm but like, like what are you? I'm like, what are you doing, dude? With that hair and that <laughs> voice and that shirt, what is going stop on that. with you? Yeah, you stop that. Um, okay, so let's talk about some of your favorite interviews or speaking engagements. Like, what are some of the highlights? And I know there's a lot, but what yeah, are a few I that stand out? All right, so that's really hard to it's really hard to break down. I know you sent me some questions and I didn't look I I didn't look at this and think about it because I really wanted to work off the the top of my head. I get lazy. All right. So, um <laughs> recently I did a really cool one with uh, uh my friend Raul Leal. He's the CEO of SH Hotels and Resorts. I thought I'd tie it into the sustainability thing because that brand one hotels is uh they they strive to be zero carbon emissions, right? So, uh, he thought it would be fun instead of him coming out on and doing your your regular talky talk speechy speech that um, I would come on and pretend it was a podcast and have him on as a guest and do that. It was fun. It was different. It was awesome. Also, I did an event this fall with a company called Reigns. And what was really fun was they just wanted to laugh and have a good time because they had just merged with another organization. So they wanted to get to know people. So we set it up where we just asked dumb questions and almost made it like a game show. Um, and people laughed. 
Uh, some of the coolest speaking gigs that I've done is uh, like on stage in front of uh, 5,000 people interviewing the CEO of a major hotel company at their annual event and doing stuff like that. And um, also doing my Friday night audit happy hour comedy show from a uh, boxing ring in Atlantic City before going to see uh, my favorite band Fish. So little things like that. Okay, so, well, first, let's talk about Raul, who I'm, I'm between you and I, nobody else is listening, yeah. of course. I'm begging PR to get him on the show. Yeah. Um, and I did just return from Hanalei Bay, one hotels. Oh, good for um, you. You're one I, up on me. I have, I'm a total groupie. I've been studying that brand. I am fascinated by the by just the intuition that Barry had, mm -hmm. Raul is leading that company. It, they are doing amazing things. And I learned a lot from your interview with him. Um, uh, yeah, but and really, I, I think what we came away from that, uh, I'm sure you'll be on the same page with this, is the lack of preachiness. They're just going ahead and doing it. And I think a lot of sustainability is a lot about, look at me, look at me, as opposed to it happening. And their focus on biophilic design, and the subtlety of everything and the little details that we're taking care of, um, I think really make a tremendous difference on how people will perceive sustainability in a hotel going forward. Absolutely. And, but I think it speaks to the fact that it's embedded. It is a culture, mm -hmm. which he talks a lot about in that interview. Oh yeah. Uh, the mattresses are really comfortable. I say embedded the entire <laughs> time I was there. Sorry. <laughs> but it, I don't know why yes. it's so corny today. Yes, I love yeah. I love corny. Um, so you're exactly right. It's very authentic, mm -hmm. and I think when you have a product that's authentic, yep. you don't have to preach, and you don't have to wave your finger at people because it just comes through in everything you do. So um, mm -hmm. hats off to them. So there was another question I was going to ask, and now I don't even. Oh, I know. So let's make it apropos to someone who yeah. thinks I want to. I want to be mm -hmm. Glenn when I grow right. up. Yeah. What advice would you give someone who wants to be in the media business, wants to, you know, make yeah. speaking a huge part of their, what they do? What kind of All advice? All right. So uh, number one, don't, because I can't <laughs> handle the competition. I think we already established I'm delicate. But uh, if you do, a uh, couple of things that you should really think about is you need to be your authentic you. The more successful that I feel I've become, not professionally, but in terms of skill set, is when I am able to be ultimately who I am. The more me I could be, whether you like it or not, it works out better for me in terms of being able to create a, a package. I have a very definitive me. I'm, I'm super corny. But I also try to back that up with um, my knowledge and insight. And that takes us to the next point. You really have to understand what your business is or at least be super, super curious to ask the right questions. So many times there's so much great content that can be mined by simply listening to what your guest is saying. And I've seen this a thousand times on stage when I was learning by what not to do, the moderator of a panel would ask someone a question. They'd have such a great answer that led me to a thousand more questions. And then the person looks down on their sheet of paper, ignores all that, and goes on to number three from number two on the list. So listen and respond while be ultimately yourself. Also, you've got to figure out what your angle is is how are you going to approach things and how are you going to really connect with your audience through that approach for me um it changes every once in a while it has to do with how i feel inside um what my my ability is for work and how i see the uh the market changing which is why i love these uh shorter videos i've also kind of moved away from doing um full up live podcasts on location because it's easier for me to just do some uh recording uh, when I'm on location, for example. So don't um, overcomplicate things easier. The more work you create for yourself, the more work you're going to have to do. And while that works well in the short term, you've got to have dedication. You've got to do it week after week or day after day or whatever your cadence is. And uh, if you make too much work for yourself, you're going to wind up quitting a lot quicker. All right. I, I think that's my advice. No, that, that, that I mentioned was... just don't do it at all. <laughs> Sorry. You did. You mentioned that in the beginning, right. but we're going to just check that. All right. Just write, that just is great it. advice. And mm -hmm. as um, a person who is new at this, but loves it, yeah. I can tell you one thing I am, I have 
been guilty of is not listening enough. And it's something I'm working mm-hmm. really hard. Oh, on. That's that's difficult because you, you don't do this inherently, right? I, at least, you know, besides getting the one up by being porn curious, uh, <laughs> I was a print journalist for a long time, right? You know, I started as a journalist in 93 working for music and entertainment magazine. So I learned those skills along the way. And when I transferred, remember, I did 100 episodes of a podcast and I had to learn that skill set, which is different than a skill set on stage. But I did it before anybody was paying attention. So, <laughs> you know, so you worked just, out oh, all those kinks early. I worked before. out all those kinks yeah. and the guests didn't know what was going on either because uh, they had never done a podcast before. Um, so everyone was kind of uh, figuring it out, you know, kind of like a prom night. <laughs> <laughs> Wow. Okay. Um, anyway. All right. So that is such great advice. Let's move into the elephant in the room, Uh-oh. which is what is your sentiment on sustainable hospitality? I know that you have twins, right? I, I do. And uh, this is going to come as a shock, but I would like to see an environment for them that is uh, healthy in the future, especially when they choose, if they choose to uh, go ahead and have families them, them themselves. I'm a big proponent of the whole idea behind sustainability, but I think the intersection between commerce and sustainability hasn't always gone in the right direction to encourage people to do the right thing. Fortunately, now with some of the brands we're seeing emerging, with some of the technologies that we're seeing emerging, with a lot more will behind it, we're seeing ways that people could be profitable while focusing on sustainability at the same time. And with that now happening, I'm super encouraged about where we're going to be headed in the future. That's a great point. Um, I think it is getting easier. And I think when people think about, for instance, Raul, they built that brand around it and they think, Mm -hmm. oh gosh, I could never do that. But it's, I really believe it's about being intentional um, Mm -hmm. and, and doing it authentically, but maybe you start small and you build on that. So have there been places that you've gone recently besides one hotel or that you were impressed by things they, they were doing or that you noticed with sustainability? Yes. No, no. Okay. Well, but, but that doesn't necessarily mean they're not doing doing it. Yeah. What it could very well mean is that the experience is invisible to the guest. And isn't that what you want anyway? People don't want to feel like they're sacrificing, but they also want to feel like they're doing the wrong thing. So they're doing the right thing. So I don't want to communicate the wrong message there. But I would say one suggestion is let's get larger garbage cans in the uh, in the (laughs) guest rooms. If you're going to be wanting me to self sort the recycling from the non recycling uh, can only hold one bottle and then pretty much it's overflowing. (laughs) And then I feel badly for the housekeepers. They're either sorting or bending over and too many times. And I I can't handle the guilt. So how do your kids do they have, um, you know, with you in the business Mm -hmm. and them out of age where now they're starting to form opinions about probably travel. Mm -hmm. Do they have a certain way that they like to travel and there's no right or wrong answer? I'm just curious, like that age, what, what's their sentiment on traveling in general? Right. I think that they're still at the point of their life where uh, if they could travel, they absolutely love it. And they don't really care where or how they do it. Because I remember, you know, they're they're almost 20. So, you know, they've got their bodies bounce back. So they're still (laughs) in that squeeze 10 kids into a hotel room and nobody cares kind of a phase of their life. Now it's like. I'm going to an event in April with my friends and I'm like, you will not be sharing a room (laughs) with me. (laughs) Yeah. I forget how far away that is from my current age. It's like, yeah, at that point I was still probably going to Myrtle beach and like, I don't know, 10 of us in a car on the way down. Like you didn't care. Yeah. It didn't really matter. I'll sit like this for the next six hours. As long as I get a, you know, some beer at the end of it, who cares? Exactly. (laughs) But what's my reward? Yeah. So, but I will say one thing that I have noticed about this generation, and I'm speaking about generation Z and my children in particular is that they see sustainability as a natural part of life. Kind of like how they're digital natives. They're almost, I would say, maybe to coin a phrase, sustainable natives, right? They don't have to learn it like uh, us, you know, you know, sustainable, you know, transient type people came into it. So I think that 
for them inherently, it's a big deal. I remember coming home from college and saying, dad, we need to start recycling. And we started like, you know, putting the cans in a separate container and that's all we did, but it felt pretty good. And, and that worked out now, you know, a lot of the things that I've learned over the years are just entry stakes and the way of doing things. Um, yes. So they don't really think as much about it because they're already living it and espousing those particular values. And, you know, that's interesting because I think if you are a hospitality organization, you certainly want to hire within, a, you know, all demographics mm -hmm. um, and, and age ranges. However, I think it's very important to talk to that age group because I think we can learn from them mm -hmm. about different things and ideas and practices. So engaging them in conversation, I think, is important in a sustainability journey you know, um, as a, as a hotel, what do you, I mean, we, we touched on this a little bit, but what do yeah. you feel is the biggest barrier or preventing hotels is just the complication of it all? No, I think it's, um, money and will if, um, you know, you could remove friction from going sustainable and show that it's a zero sum game, or you could put more money in your pocket then it's going to be a winner. I don't mean to be crass doing the right thing is the right thing, but I've been out there a long time. People say a lot of things and then live differently. If uh, the only way to make things work when it comes to living in a capitalist society like us is the way to make it profitable for them. And I'm actually working with some companies. I won't plug them here behind the scenes and as a strategic advisor focused on sustainability that I think meet those marks because then it's a real true win for the owner, win for the vendor and a win for the customer. Absolutely. That's a, that's a great point. And that's why, you know, I think th really being strategic about the business case for it based on your DNA, your hospitality group, Right. you got to spend some time on the front end, figure out what your guests want, figure out what's good for your specific hotel, and then you can reap those benefits later. So, yep. yeah. Um, what do you see the future hospitality being like? You know, we talk about AI and VR and there's even hotels out there that are now going to have what's it called like trading for, um EV hotel yeah, right. what do you what do you see yeah, the there, future there, first of like? all I, we don't need a crypto trading floor for something i could do on my phone through an app so <laughs> that's not i don't think that's re really realistic in in the future no offense to uh, to to those folks i hope it works uh, well but um when it comes to uh, VR, I call BS. I don't really see that as uh, something that's viable. The, at least the last round of stuff made me so sick. And um, I, I think going to some of these theme parks and stuff with the, you know, with the the screens and the 3D goggles, it just it makes you nauseous as well. Uh, I think augmented reality has a chance. But to bring it back to the theme parks, I was actually at uh, Super Nintendo World at Universal Studios Hollywood couple of weeks ago, uh, catch our Friday night audit episode that I did live from there. Um, but I wanted to go check out this ride because I'm a, I'm a geek for theme park design. And the one thing that I noticed was I spent so much time worrying about the images that were on my goggles, I wasn't enjoying the real environment. Mm -hmm. And isn't the whole point of us getting out there and doing things to be part of the natural and built environments as opposed to a virtual environment? So I think from the guest point of view, it's not going to be successful. However, I think it's a banger of a home run when it comes to designing and developing hotels. Guys that know, you know, men and women that know how to get deals closed don't necessarily understand how this lamp will work with this sofa, which will work with this, with this, you know, this experience here. So they can see it, feel it, and understand it. It will also help save money, which is a kind of a great thing. So sometimes a technology that on first blush seems like it's not going to work is going to be very successful in ways that we didn't think or expect. And that's kind of how I see it with VR. So yeah. using it as a design aid or a design um Right, platform. and even pre-trip even pre, even, uh, pre -trip sell, right? Like uh, I'm home and I'm dreaming uh, yeah. about being in this resort. I could experience it that way, and then I'll want to go and and do it. Oh, I love that. Okay. What, what other cool technologies have you seen out there? Whatever they could be, whether they're for cost savings, whether they're for efficiency, whether they're so, for anything. Right. Right. I totally get what you're saying. One cool technology I, I saw, but I don't think the company was able uh, to, to make it not for them, not 
by their own fault, but there's others that are going to come along with it. It's these new rounds of self-serve check-in kiosks that actually have a human being that you connect to via screen should you need that person. I think that is, again, it's a win-win for the customer. Yeah. They come in at two in the morning. Somebody doesn't necessarily have to be there. They could still feel like they could talk to a human being, get their key if they need to, and uh, go about their memory their merry way while it alleviates a potential hiring issue or a fiscal problem that a particular hotel might be having. I think stuff like that is pretty good. Other technologies that I think are going to uh, be really well is anything that helps save time with back of house or marketing tasks. Those kinds of things are where we could really excel. We want our people to have guest facing jobs, creating experiences, not being in a back room, doing stuff that a computer can do either now or in a few years from now. Great, great point. Automation is key, mm -hmm. right? Um, so what do you think we can do? What, what is it that is going to help get the hospitality industry out of this labor shortage crisis? Uh, I think that the, there is no such thing as a labor shortage. Um, okay. I'm tired of people saying that, uh, what the Smack situation me. is, no, but what I think the situation I, is, is you not paying people enough that they want to work for you. Now, I'm not saying it's always affordable to do that, and I understand how it's a yin and yang kind of uh, of thing. But these tools that we can take, uh, you know, we can eliminate bodies from the property, that's going to be able to pay the people that are still there more while still saving money in the long run. And I think that's going to be the kind of right formula. You're also seeing, uh, Amy, that there's a strong focus on extended stay properties mm -hmm. right now. The cover, you know, the headline you're going to read is because it's a it was a previously untapped market and a lot of people want to stay there. But behind the scenes, they cost so much less to operate. You need fewer people. The expectations by the guests are streamlined and a lot different than a full service hotel or a traditional select service hotel that it seems to make a lot of sense. And again, that's why it, they're taking off because it's a win for the customer and a win for the owner operator. I like it. So who do you think is nailing it right now um, when it comes to their offering? You know, do you have a favorite hotel? Do you have a favorite hotel group? I know you made- I, I, Right. I don't necessarily have a favorite hotel or favorite hotel group because I kind of like, I love this business so much. Whoever I was with last is my favorite. favorite. So it's really, okay. it's really hard to, to pick any. Um, that are out there, but anyone that's out there really creating memorable uh, experiences that disconnect me from how much I'm spending, I think that's a <laughs> that's the kind of place that I like to be at. Do you have a do you have a what's what's a recent trip other than the one you went to on Miami? What's a recent trip that you took that you really loved? Um, let's see what I really loved. Let's see. Uh, let's see. I was in, uh, LA last week. I really enjoyed seeing the new, um, uh, Moxie and AC ah. in downtown LA. Okay. I stayed there, but before that I'll stay at the Wayfarer. What I love about the Wayfarer and this property is that emphasis on that rooftop lounge. Um, I really love that particularly in a good climate zone. I love to be outside. So to me, <clears throat> those things make for absolutely fabulous, uh, experiences in December. I had the most um, wonderful, incredible suite at the resorts world. So that was a, a whole a lot of fun over there. I really, uh, I really like staying at their Crockford's uh, product, which is their high end product. Thank you, uh, Shannon, for providing me with that room. <laughs> I really appreciate it. I did a speaking uh, gig for the Nevada Hotel. Little Lodge perk of the job, eh? Well, I, you know, I did a speaking gig for for them. I hosted a Shark okay. Tank event, which was really cool, oh, which was cool. focused on. Um, People pitching the uh, some new hotel technologies, and then a panel of uh, experts, uh, you know, you know, voting on them. So that was uh, pretty pretty cool. Um, yeah, I bet. Really, anywhere I, I got to tell you again, anywhere I am, I freaking love. I was uh, I was at a Renaissance in Toledo, Ohio last week, and I want to thank the good folks at uh, First Hospitality for having me do a keynote at their event. But they had. And David, I'm talking to you, buddy. They had the coolest effing bartender downstairs who made such a connection with me and the other patrons in there that I stayed longer, I spent more money, and I came back the next day when oh, I nice. might have chosen to go somewhere else because he made me feel at home. 
And that, at the end of the day, yeah. beats any other amenity or service that you could offer. Absolutely. You didn't call me though. I'm I'm disappointed. You're, wait, um, you're in Toledo? No, but I'm in Ohio. I mean Ohio's a big place. Well, you know. How far is Columbus from Toledo? That's gotta it, be a few hours. Yeah, it is a couple hours, probably two hours. Okay. All but right. all right. You know, so I'm just far. on the edge of a uh, jerk, not a jerk. You guys out there decide. Um, hey, you're in New York. Have you been to Casa Cipriani yet? Uh, no, because I'm out on Long Island and New York is too stressful for me to go to, Long except if I'm going to see a concert or something. Long Island. Okay, yeah, I'm, out here on, I'm, here, I'm out here on Long Island, you know, eating pizza, drinking the water and all that kind of stuff. So, you know. If you make it in to Manhattan, yes. you got to go. Yes. It's uh, yeah. top notch. I know. Well, the problem is, Amy, that it's either like an hour and a half for me to take the train with the driving over to the train station, or it's 47 miles to the Moxie Times Square, and it took me up to three hours to drive there. And oh when you're gosh. thinking about doing that back and forth, yeah. I'm just too old and tired with the amount yeah. of travel that I already do. So no, I'm sorry, I, New York. I can I can see that. That makes sense. Um, so, you know, one of the things you are known for is being so positive. How do you stay so positive all the time? Uh, honestly, I think it's just I, I think it's just the way I was blessed to be born. My my brain chemistry. I'm very 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 fortunate. Um, stuff bothers me, but I'm able to process it pretty quickly and you know shove it down or compartmentalize <laughs> it or just deal with it. So you know I don't know. Very fortunate. That it's way. a great and skill I, to have, and I don't think you would be in this business if that was not um, uh, a major characteristic of your personality. But I also feed off of amazing people, right? And uh, being in hospitality, I feel like it's one of those self-selecting industries where people that are outgoing personalities um, kind of gravitate to. So it always seems to be, wherever I am, a positive feedback loop, and I get to talk to so many awesome freaking people. So it's cool. Yeah, it is. And it makes life much more enjoyable. So, yeah, for sure. um, well, that being, that, I, that being said, I still, uh, I still say the F word every single morning I wake up and I have to get out of bed. Now, that's not a sign of unhappiness. That's just a sign of creativity, isn't it? <laughs> that's what yeah, I love that. <laughs> I think they did a poll swear one, I don't know, it was a couple of years ago and it said yeah. that Ohioans say the F yeah. word more than anywhere else. And I thought, come on, that can't be true. Is that because of the gray? It's because of the gray weather we have, I think. Uh, well, as somebody who lived in Brooklyn for almost 20 years, <laughs> I disagree with that statement. All right. Yeah, that exactly. Well, I am sure you are jet setting off to somewhere. And so I don't want to keep you. Uh, what else can we plug? I, I'm actually home for a couple of weeks. Nashville is my next trip. So I'm looking forward okay. to uh, going to the peg leg porker. So let's plug that. You want some good barbecue? Peg Lake Parker Lake. in Nashville, actually owned by a heavy set guy with one leg. So, uh, <laughs> and it's wooden. Literally, he calls himself the Peg Lake Parker. Hey, that's that is being authentic right there, right? That's it doesn't what, get more what, authentic than that. Listen, uh, you, it doesn't. That just uh, share the love with uh, the universe. The world will be a better place, and we'll all find ourselves more successful. You're and check exactly out NoVegasyNews.com, please. Yes. Text the word hotel to 66866 and subscribe to our weekly newsletter. That's hotel to 66866. And we're going to put that in our show notes and all the Thank different you. places that everyone can find you because there's not lots of, you know, hot industry news coming out of all of your outlets. And yeah. we want to make sure people can find you. So hot. Glenn. Thank you from the Thank bottom you, of my heart. I appreciate it. It was great to chat with you. And I can't well, my, wait to my run left into ventricle you. appreciates you. Yeah, my right one. <laughs> still on the fence, but there's still Working time. Hard. What'd you have for breakfast? <laughs> <laughs> uh, I, I I had a banana, but I was tempted by the cinnamon bun that was oh, downstairs. Yeah. I know. Yeah. Yeah. Well, thank you very much. I hope you have a great day. And um, thank you, everyone, for tuning back into the Sustainable Hospitality Podcast. We will see you next time. And whatever you do, make intentional choices because Glenn will be watching if you don't. That's right. We don't need any of that nastiness going on. So be good. Take care of the world. Yes. Like, subscribe, leave us a review. And don't forget to go to www.greenluxinc. That's G-R-E-E-N-L-U-X-E-I-N-C and Use the contact form to stay in touch with us. 
We're here for all your sustainability needs. Have a great day, everybody. We'll see you soon. We want to thank you for tuning back into the Sustainable Hospitality Podcast. Keep the conversation going and visit the contact page at greenluxinc.com and sign up for our monthly newsletter where we will bring you the latest developments and breaking news in sustainable hospitality and tourism. That's www.greenluxeinc.com. And if you're ready to start your sustainability journey and would like some help on knowing what that could look like, book a complimentary call with us today. Until our next episode, remember, sustainability is your ticket to a healthier planet and a healthier bottom line. Don't forget to like, subscribe, and leave us a review.